And what the questions that you see on this slide are what remain after I've stripped out individual questions and pasted them on individual slides. So um, the punchline with respect to this chart is that all four of these questions relate to uh, our thoughts on emerging market investing. In other words, these people that we talk to every month uh, now understand and recognize that, uh, at least recognize our opinion that EFA does not belong in a portfolio if you're constructing it pursuant to modern portfolio theory. And so the question is, well, what about emerging markets? And, and because that's something I have never commented on. And the reason I haven't is if you look at this chart, I can only get data for emerging markets. In this case, the emerging markets ETF going back to 2003. So that is 16 years of data. Whereas my statements with respect to the EFA uh, go back 20, I'm using 25 years of data. And so I don't, I don't want to categorically say that emerging markets don't exist along the efficient frontier because I simply can't say that. I can't com make an apples to apples comparison to the 25 year data that I'm using in that analysis. But take a careful look at this slide of the emerging markets index it's not an index, sorry, it's an ETF going back 16 years. And the inception of this was 2003. What we experienced here was a reflection of the China boom. So this is very similar to the Japanese boom that I talked about in the context of EFA. With respect to EEM, the Emerging Markets ETF, this thing soared like a rocket with the China boom but the China boom peaked in 2007. Ever after that, the emerging markets index here, the emerging markets ETF has gone nowhere. Think of that, gone nowhere for 12 years. Even as the S&P 500 in this chart, you're looking at EFA, and you see the peak in 2007, I'm sorry, not EFA, emerging markets, EEM, you see that peak in 2007, and it has gone sideways for 12 years, even as the S&P 500 more than doubled during that period. And so what I would, the, my, my conclusion is, look, I'm not going to tell anybody that they shouldn't be owning emerging markets. I'm just going to suggest, look, you take a look at this data, and then you decide what you want in a portfolio. My personal view would be, no, I wouldn't own EFO. One of the important things to understand is how heavily weighted EEM is to China. China is a big piece, the biggest single piece of the Emerging Markets Index. One last chart. Here's China's real GDP. You can see how we've built up to this huge crescendo, this peak in GDP growth in 2007. And lo and behold, that coincides perfectly with the peak in Chinese stocks and also in this chart, commodities. So this China bubble affected both the emerging markets index and commodities in a huge way. And we've been on the backside of that ever since now for um, 12 years. So again, my, uh, I, I don't have a recommendation for investing. So, but your main objection is that China uh, dominates that index, yes. dominates the emerging markets, and that, um, and that China has peaked in, G, in, in, in GDP for now. But also, are you concerned about is, is part of this a reflection of your concern about the Chinese market itself being controlled by the government and not, you know, because of uh, it has a history, I think, of liquidity being uh, fueled by government action? Well, um, I'm not making any comments with respect to my outlook for Chinese stocks. I'm simply saying 
just look at the history of this. And in the, the history is that the China miracle, let's call it, blew up the EEM, just like Japan blew up the IFA index. When I say blew up, I mean, it, it had this, this r r ridiculously outsized influence on the index because the Chinese stock market went through the roof, but that was a one-off event. And so You're saying I, this is Ch China is a one-off that's distorted and made investors yes. project out, extrapolate out for the long run that that that's a thing that's going to continue. Yes, exactly. Whereas now, if you look at this slide that's up on the screen, you can say, okay, so so EEM just exploded, and again, it's very similar to the phenomenon that we experienced with EFA. It was the event that got people to pay attention to emerging markets saying, oh, well, henceforth, we all need to own emerging markets. Look at the opportunity there. And I'm simply saying, well, but look carefully at the history here. It was China, China, and China. And since then, since the Chinese miracle, the index has gone nowhere, even as the S&P 500 has um, more than doubled. And so I just, I, I, I would just say, look, you guys, you make your own opinion i you know and maybe it hinges on your opinion long term for china yes my personal view and this, i'm not i'm not expressing this to our people but my my own view is i don't want any part of investing in china just for the reasons that you just said and plus you know the the stocks in these indexes are just the they're the they're the uh, the the chinese dogs it's it's the dogs of the chinese market that are state owned companies and they're basically you know, dying assets in many cases. Ah, okay, okay. I was wondering if that was part of, or are you simply saying, you know, Chinese GDP is, you know, it's, it's peaked. And that, but that is another good point, Andy, because what, what we saw is the peak, you saw the acceleration in GDP growth, meaning the rate of change was increasing, increasing, increasing until it peaked in 2007. And ever since then, we're seeing slowing in the rate of GDP growth. Well, that's not a great recipe for a stock market slowing in the rate of growth even though you know you i guess you could have individual success stories which brings me to the last point when it comes to giving advice i would say look it, you know there may be active managers who can buy stocks in emerging markets but they but if you're going to be successful i think you should find an active manager who can go anywhere he is he is unconstrained he doesn't have to hug a an EEM benchmark, which is going to be heavily weighted to those Chinese dogs I was talking about. And he can go anywhere in the world in emerging markets, Indonesia, Philippines, yes, China, maybe Taiwan, Korea, and so forth. And he might find opportunity. And so I wouldn't categorically say, no, you don't want to own anything related to emerging markets. I would say the way to do it if you want to invest is to find an active manager who has a demonstrated record of beating the S&P 500. If you can find such a thing, then that would be okay. The other thing that I'm seeing is, you know, when you started out and you looked at those first, those that grouping of questions, and they were mm -hmm. all four questions uh, related to the, um, the EEM. Mm -hmm. um, it's like, I feel like you're having a conversation now with people about this issue. I think that, you know, you, judge, judging from the, the, the emails that we received, you know, for instance, that one uh, from Guy, um, Guy Cumby, um, yeah. about, about this. I mean, this has triggered a real debate, I think. And uh, so I'm glad you're, you're delving into that. I mean, do you, do you see that, right? That we're. Yes, absolutely. People are, people are, just, are discussing this. It's, a, it's an important issue. And I think it's terrific. And I think people have actually, you know, taken note of our commentary on IFA. And uh, actually, I think mo I think people are really uh, uh, absorbing this and internalizing and saying, yeah, you know, what you're saying makes perfect sense. Because people, broadly speaking, I mean, when I go to into meetings in rooms, people are really sick of owning these stocks. And and it's just one one year after another of underperformance. And and yet they've been told they need to own international in their portfolios. And they're saying, what gives here? And I'm giving them a reason to say, chuck it, get out of that. 
on slide number eight, um, the first I, I, I uh, pasted the first question onto slide number eight. Earnings and cash flow are good metrics for valuing the market, but isn't the market really the only game in town? Really, who wants to tie their money up for 30 years to get about 2%? With real interest rates negative, I'm surprised the market isn't up more. Even if the market stays flat, at least dividends grow every year. So there's no question here, it's just a statement, but I thought it was an interesting point of departure uh, to comment on the Fed's, the so-called Fed stock valuation model. So again, it's not a question, it's a statement, but I thought it was an interesting statement. And um, and what he's saying is with the dividend with the with the dividend yield on the S P five hundred at two point nine percent, and you can get one point eight percent in a ten year treasury, why would anybody own stocks? I mean, uh would why would anybody um own bonds? Which takes us to the the so called Fed stock valuation model. In other words, it's the relationship between bond yields and the stock market's P.E. ratio. And it's called the Fed valuation model because Alan Greenspan, Greenspan was the guy who first commented on this phenomenon, which was that through his tenure at the Fed, there was this perfect correlation between the earnings yield and the bond yield. You can see that in this top chart, which was to say that as bond yields came down, then the market's P.E. ratio expanded, but that stopped happening. The market's P.E. ratio stopped expanding. So here's the point. In the bottom chart, you can see the degree to which the stock market is hypothetically undervalued. According to the Fed valuation model, which is broken, I might, I should add, <clears throat> nobody's paying attention to it anymore, but it, <clears throat> but it, theoretically, it makes perfect sense. The stock market is 70% undervalued. <laughs> you, you see that in this bottom chart. So in other words, the stock market was fairly valued all during this period when the Fed valuation model was working, but then you had this, um, this uh, disassociation, this uh, decoupling of bond yields and the market's P-E ratio. So today the market would be hypothetically 70% undervalued. Here's another way of looking at it which I've summarized over here. If the earnings yield, which is the inverse of the PE ratio, were equal to the 10-year treasury yield, which is what was happening up here, then the stock market's PE ratio today would be 59 times. And it's actually 18.8 .8 times. So it's just a really interesting observation. And that's what this guy is, uh, is noting. So he's a big fan of investing in stocks and why would anyone own bonds when uh, the relationship so favors common stocks. Yeah, so even though the uh, this this measure is broken, no longer works that model in these times, it's just interesting to note that it yes. is so out of whack. And it and it provides it provides valuation support too. And it's part and parcel of what I was talking about when I talk about the market's PE ratio, and you may recall this, I'm saying that, you know. To the extent we are in a new world where we're going to continue to see negative interest rates abroad and record low bond yields here, well, then we should probably recalibrate and say the market's current 18.18 eight times earnings at least is fair. It may not be, you know, cheap, but um, that that in a super low inflation and interest rate environment uh, today, then today's PE multiple does make perfect sense. Uh, so let me just say it again. This argument and this analysis provides support for today's PE ratio, all, you know, very high PE ratio, at least by historic comparison. And the reason we're it is because we are also in unprecedented negative bond yields, uh, at least abroad territory. Now the world has never seen anything like this before. So it's it's probably something you're saying that we, you know it could be something that we need to get used to because it may yes. be headed in that direction it should be headed in that direction if you're right about yes. the demographic trends driving that long term and i wouldn't you know, i'm not saying that the mark that the rate pe ratio is going to go back go to 59 times and the you know this fed valuation model is going to snap back into being 
connected, but I, I am saying that at least it suggests there's value in the stock market, even at 18.8 .8 times earnings. And by the way, I meant to mention it before, that China chart that you showed, mm -hmm. that, that provides support for your demographic. That, that, yeah. that coincides with the whole demographic trend that you've looked yes. at, where as countries become wealthier, their birth rates decline and their labor force uh, shrinks. Yeah. Growth, right. the labor force growth shrinks. And so the, so the GDP growth continues to slow. Okay, the, the next chart is, I don't know if you even want to comment on this because I don't quite understand what he's saying, but nonetheless, um, question number three was slide 29 chart of earnings throws has an odd horizontal alternative quarters in one year intervals. Can you explain? I'm not sure, I don't quite understand what he's saying, but I would just say that the, the horizontals here, let's say in 2014-15, and the horizontal here in 2019 are periods during which earnings went sideways. And then the last one is um, question number four was interest rates are down, yields are low. There's also talk about bubble in the bond markets. How can one optimize a 60-40 portfolio? And I think what he's really asking is, when there, there isn't much yield available, how the heck are we supposed to achieve portfolio returns, you know, close to the historic returns? And the answer is you can't. And you can't jettison bonds. You can't simply not own bonds and own 100% common stocks because you don't like the return on bonds. You can't do that because you have to manage risk. And so that led me to just reiterating and repeating the, the, uh, the, the notion of this chart, which is to say, if we were sitting down with a client today and we're talking about expected future portfolio returns, this is the way I view the world. In a standard 60-40 portfolio, I give common stocks 8%. You know, I'm just being conservative there. The long-term number is about 10%. And lo and behold, this year we're <clears throat> tracking you know very nicely to the 10 percent but anyway eight percent for common stocks and three percent for bonds whereas historically that number has been higher maybe five percent maybe even higher than that and we may be being generous with three percent but nonetheless that gives you that would give you a six percent weighted expected re portfolio return and you know he uses the term optimize. I'm not sure that's the right word. How can one optimize a 60-40 portfolio? The, the optimization comes in the you know the the uh, the efficient frontier um, analysis that I presented, where you own the fixed income and the stocks you own that, that, that you actually own in a portfolio do lie along that efficient frontier. And if you own something that's not there, then kick it out and replace it with something else. So that's the notion of optimization. But I thought that his real question is, well, you know, in a, in a world of low interest rates, how are we going to get the return in the portfolio? And the answer is you're not. You just have to live with it. You have to get your clients to save more. <laughs> and, and, um, and you know, spend less. Uh, it, you know, in in retirement, or expect to spend less in retirement because your nest egg is going to be growing slower than it has in the past. But you know, on a real return, by the way, that's not true because low inflation. But nominally, that's true. Okay, that's it. Okay, um, great job. Uh, please. Um, I guess, you know, I don't have to worry about saying anything else.